I understand the statistics overall in Africa of churches being destroyed, of Christians being butchered. They're staggering. Can you fill us on, on the latest numbers? Going down, let's say, sub-Saharan Africa, this is mm-hmm. a nightmare. In Nigeria, where you have a bona fide genocide, just between January and April of this year, you had 1,500 Christians were hacked to death. No, how many people in the West even heard of that? They heard that about mm-hmm. 248 Palestinians were killed. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us in the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola, we ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment, that they might hear your voice and obey your command. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, friends, if you're following along on uh, the American calendar, there's there's different holidays being celebrated, there are different months being celebrated. Here's a date that you should know. Uh, yesterday was the anniversary of Bunker Hill, uh, a very important Amer- uh, battle in the American Revolution. It's been forgotten, and I think we forget it at a very great cost. To help us to understand why this is significant even now, that it's not just trivia, uh, my guest is with American Majority, and he's recently published a book called The Adversaries, a story of Boston and Bunker Hill. Ned Ryan, welcome to The Catholic Current. Yeah, no, great to be with you, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk talk about the book, and, and you're right. I mean, yesterday, the Battle of Bunker Hill was the first set battle of the American Revolution, and, and we really have forgotten it. But there was a reason that we fought it, and there were many things over the last nine or ten months before the battle that led, really, truly led Englishmen. I mean, let's not forget at the time, Massachusetts was 85% direct English lineage, not Scottish, not Irish, but led them to actually go on to that hill and confront front their, their countrymen. And why did they fight? And then that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. I mean, I wrote the book because I love the figure of Dr. Joseph Warren, who I know we'll discuss, but mm-hmm. I love the idea of like exploring why did we actually take up arms and fight and what led us to do that? You know, uh, you know in the beginning of your book, you, you mentioned that. You know, I'm thinking back to my time as a boy, and this was the first real battle in the American Revolution. But as a kid, I was right. taught it really was us versus them, that there was a strong sense that, you know, we're, we're Americans, damn it. And somehow we were saying that in the 1770s, which, of course, is, is ridiculous because <laughs> no one talked like John Wayne in the 1770s. Uh, but, but this was Englishmen versus Englishmen. This was a civil war. As you pointed out, men who fought was- side by side, he does, uh, you know, in, say, against the, the French and Indians, are now turning on each other. How did that happen? This is, again, you're right. I mean, this is this is only about a dozen years after the French and Indian War ended, where, where the American colonists and, and the English had fought side by side. They're all English, again. They're all from, mm-hmm. you know, direct English lineage. They fought side by side, and all of a sudden, 12 years later, they, they start fighting each other. And, and quite frankly, in a very brutal and savage way, uh, I, I addressed some of the Battle of Lexington and Concord, which... Everybody seems to think, you know, ended at the Lexington Green and eight American militiamen died and nine were wounded and that was it. Well, actually, it was a day-long battle, running battle, where almost 300 British regulars uh, were killed and wounded. Uh, and, and, you know, more than 100 Americans at the end of the day were also killed uh, and wounded. But the reason that we got to that point, there, there are a couple different reasons. One is the the colonists that had come over from England, they brought over with them ideas that were born from England. The idea of the Magna Carta, the idea of the 1628 Petition of Rights, the 1689 Bill of Rights. They had a charter of Massachusetts. All of these things had either been passed by Parliament or assented to by English kings. And the colonists viewed the ideas encapsulated in those documents as sacrosanct, that mm-hmm. – we, we, we are not going to quarter troops in private homes. We have the right to self-defense. We have the right to free speech. We have the right to free elections. Quite frankly, we have the right to govern ourselves. And you see that all of the sudden that the Englishmen on this side of the Atlantic, they didn't agree with the Englishmen on the other side of the Atlantic who really viewed those documents and those ideas as more of a series of suggestions. And when it became inconvenient for them, went around them. And created laws and passed laws. I mean, in in 1774, Parliament passed the Intolerable Acts, literally just 
punishing Boston and Massachusetts, but also really suspending the right to self-government. I mean, it just annihilated democracy in the colony. And Wait, you, you mean, you mean governments not- just ruled by decree and, and ra- ran roughshod over <laughs> God-given rights? Well, I'm glad we learned our lesson and we don't, we don't have that anymore. Isn't it great to study history? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is why we study history because, you know, I think a lot of people, and, and I know we're going to discuss this more later, but we have to understand our history because it does inform us today. And I love history. I mean, I, I, this is now my second book. The first book I, I, I wrote was called Restoring Our Republic. In really how the founders came up with their ideas, how they constructed the machinery of the republic, and their original vision and how they viewed this republic should work is wildly divergent from where mm-hmm. we are today. But I would argue that's intentional. The reason that we're not teaching this in public schools is because the progressive left realizes if we actually taught real history and what the original vision was, people might actually start to wake up and look around and go, this isn't at all what was intended. It makes no sense right. at all. So, of course, we're not teaching real history. Right, right. Well, there, there's an institutional commitment into a different kind of narrative. Friends, I'm speaking with Ned Ryan of AmericanMajority.org. We're talking about his new book published on the anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill called The Adversaries, a story of Boston and Bunker Hill. <laughs> Ned, we're living in a context now where it seems to me if we're talking about American history at all – it's not something that we should be proud of, but something that, you know, we, we to use a Catholic term, we have to go to confession for uh, because of, of American history. And it's just a parade of conceit and, and shame. What, what's driving that, and how have you been working against that, that dynamic? So, so you, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is one of the reasons that progressives want to rewrite our history. It's why they're pushing. You know, I was on the 1776 Commission. Right. I, I got appointed by Trump, got confirmed. Of course, day one, Joe Biden abolishes the 1776 commission. But one of the things that we wanted to do and had plans in place, and we're still continuing to work together, by the way, we, we hope to be able to push out some good ideas and hopefully promote some good curriculum. But we wanted to address the insidious fiction of the 1619 project and critical race theory which really wants to go and and basically undermine the very foundations of of this republic and basically say that it was an illegitimate founding. And and the whole reason that they're doing this, let me explain really quickly, why would people want to go back and say that the founding of this country was illegitimate, that our founders were were racist, um, that all of their ideas were based in a system of racism? Because if you can delegitimize the founders, you can delegitimize their documents, the Constitution and the Declaration. If you delegitimize those documents, you delegitimize everything that they're founded upon, our constitutional republic. If you've gotten to the point where you delegitimize the founders and our founding documents of the government that's formed upon it, you can, you can go from a bl- to a blank uh, slate and create whatever you want to, what is exactly what they want to do. They want right. to create a new vision for America that has nothing to do with what we are founded on. They want to create, again, critical race theory is Marxism. The socialism, all of these statist ideas, that's why you have to go back and try and, in their revisionist way, go back and basically destroy the very foundations of this country. And, you know, I, I think that if we begin to bleach out, uh, you know, not only sad chapters in American history because there are fallen human beings involved, but when we bleach out the real heroes, the sacrifices uh, that were made. And, and, you know, I know enough of, of human history to say if you compare the aftermath of the American Revolution to the aftermath of the French Revolution, the American exactly Revolution, right. the, the Constitutional Convention was a new Pentecost. I mean, after the American Revolution, we wrote documents. We didn't build guillotines. Why isn't that better known? Why isn't that being emphasized? Again, it would go back to if we really understood our history, um, people today in 21st century America would realize we've been drifting away. I, I, would, I, I really write in my first book, Restoring Our Republic, that the real drift began in the early 20th century when, mm-hmm. when progressives really truly seized power. And it was across party lines, Republicans and Democrats. And really in the first, really between 1912 and 1920, Mm-hmm. really reshaped this country into a vision of their own making, an administrative state, a massive bureaucracy. But, but uh, the thing that, that I would point to, the reason that I consider that such a massive turning point in this country, it was, again, w- wildly you know, divergent from the founders. The founding fathers, and I tell people this all the time, whatever you think about them, and again, imperfect human beings in an imperfect world, we mm-hmm. all are. 
But if you look at the founders, the one thing that they got absolutely right is they understood human nature. I call them optimistic realists. They were realists about imperfect human nature, that it should never be trusted with consolidated power, but they realized that there were God-given rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. How do you construct a government that doesn't give consolidated power to imperfect human beings, because we often do what we can, not what we should, at the same time protect our God-given rights? And that's why they created this machinery of the republic, this diffusion of power, so that the, our rights could be protected at the same time we could have the freest amount of, of, of space to really pursue all of the things that we've been given by our creator. What the progressives got wrong, they trusted human nature. They truly believed that human nature could actually be bettered in this world by a, a administrative state, by a bureaucracy, and that somehow through the vehicle of the state, we would somehow reach nirvana and utopia. And I, so I tell people, if you really want to know what went wrong, progressives trusted human nature, and now we see with a massive administrative state People doing what they can. Well, what they should, as a theologian, I know that perfect. confidence in human nature is always misplaced. Friends, when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Ned Ryan of American Majority. Yesterday was the anniversary of Bunker Hill. We're talking about that battle and how to relocate a missing American hero. Remember, our rallying cry here at the Catholic Current is Christus Mundo, Mundus Christo, bringing Christ to the world and the world to Christ. We do it because our Lord says so, for the greater glory of God, the love of our neighbor, and the salvation of our own soul. After the broadcast today, go to the thestationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcasts. Let's keep the conversation going. We'll be right back. Stay with us. This is Jesuit Father Robert McTague, host and producer of The Catholic Current. Join me on Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern when I welcome back Bishop Michael Olson of Fort Worth, Texas. He will fill us in on what happened at the meeting of America's bishops last week. Get that insider's report on The Catholic Current on Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern, coming to you from the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. This is The Catholic Current from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Catch up on an episode you've missed or share them with your family or friends. The Catholic Current is podcasted wherever you enjoy listening. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTagg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. My guest today is Ned Ryan from AmericanMajority.org. We're talking about his new book on Bunker Hill. The battle was uh, fought yesterday on June 17th, and we're talking about reclaiming American heroes and, and reclaiming American history. There's an unsung hero who, play, who was a key figure at Bunker Hill. Tell us about him, please. So the, the life of Dr. Joseph Warren has always fascinated me. And, you know, one of the interesting things, Father, that I found in my research, in his first inaugural address, Ronald Reagan said, Dr. Joseph Warren, and, and go look at the video. It's a great, uh, amazing, you know, uh, segment of video. Reagan goes, Dr. Joseph Warren, who might have been one of the greatest of the founding fathers, and he talks about him, and then he quotes from his March 6 speech, March 6, 1775 speech, and Reagan says, Warren looked out over the people of Boston and said, our country is in great danger now, but not to be despaired of. You are to decide that important question upon which rests the happiness and liberty of millions yet unborn. Act worthy of yourselves. Wow. And – so this is one of those figures I've been fascinated by. He was a young doctor. He was he just turned 34 the week before Bunker Hill. He started out as a protege of Sam Adams. But in those last nine or ten months before Bunker Hill, Warren really truly became a leader in Boston, but also in Massachusetts, and in some ways really across the colonies because he became the president of the Provincial Congress in Massachusetts. He became a major general in the standing army. And was really the spark that really helped motivate the resistance to Parliament's acts and the king's ministers. 
And he's, he's one of those guys, he was very successful. Doctor had one of the more successful medical practices in all of Boston, but was really extremely eloquent, knew how to organize. One of the random tidbits of history, too, everybody knows Paul Revere's ride, right? Mm-hmm. He, as he goes and well, warns him, not that the British are coming, because, of course, they're English. He's saying the regulars are coming. You know, prepare yourself. The one that really helped organize and, and really helped get Revere and then William Dawes, who was another writer out there, was Dr. Joseph Warren. But, you know, we've kind of forgotten some of this history. And I'll tell you why we've forgotten it. Because on the day of Bunker Hill, Joseph Warren wakes up and he knows that there's going to be fighting on the Charlestown Peninsula. And his friend Elbridge Jerry, who was his roommate at Harvard, who was also one of the leading organizers of the resistance in the colony, knows that he's going to try and go to Charlestown to fight to Breed's Hill. And mm-hmm. Elbridge says, essentially, please don't go. You're needed here. And, and Warren looks at him and goes, Dolce et decorum est pro patria mori, which means how sweet and pleasant it is to die for one's country. And he goes yes. to Bunker Hill. He actually has to borrow a musket. He rides to the top of the hill, and he, he talks with Israel Putnam, who's obviously a legendary American figure, and goes, Putnam, where the fighting is heaviest. And Putnam tries to give him command. He says, no, I'm here to fight. Putnam sends him down the hill and says, the Earth's redoubt, where William Prescott is in command, will probably be where the fighting is heaviest. Warren walks down the hill. Prescott tries to give him command. Warren says, I'm not here to command. I'm here to fight. And he becomes another musket inside that redoubt when the British come over the Charles River. And on the third charge, they come over, over the walls. And Warren actually is, is basically covering the American retreat. Uh, mm-hmm. and is killed in the process of it. And so people ask, why haven't we heard of Joseph Warren? More, why isn't he a bigger figure? I, I am convinced that he hadn't died that day on Bunker Hill covering the American retreat. He probably would have signed the Constitution. I think he might have had you know, a real shot at being president of the United States. But he died that day. And the reason I say that is not because I want that or I think that. His contemporaries, people that actually hated him, loyalists, one of them actually said, if Warren had not died that day, we might never have heard of George Washington. Hmm. That's an astonishing statement. Stuff. It, it, it really, and then you start to realize and read these other biographers of Warren who are writing about 90 years after he died and saying people, it, it's hard, basically it's hard for people to understand even then, right? A hundred years after Bunker Hill, how influential and how powerful a figure Joseph Warren was at the time. But he was not only one of the leading men in the colony of Massachusetts, he was one of the leading men in all of North America. And we've kind of forgotten his life, and I think that's a shame, and that's why I wrote the book, because I think this man, he was a singular man. He was a man who, who in, the, in the very face of real, uh, of real threat to, to his personal safety, I mean, there's, there's that moment when he goes and speaks at the Old South Meeting House in March of 1775, and there's 5,000 Bostonians. And I've been to the Old South Meeting House. It seems incredible you could fit 5,000 in there. But he's speaking on the fifth anniversary of the Boston Massacre. And 30 to 40 British officers come, and they sit on the pulpit steps. And they've come to intimidate him. There's even talk that if he says anything they consider seditious, they're going to kill him in front of these gathered Bostonians. And he looks out over their heads, and he he basically preaches to these Bostonians about what their rights are, what's at stake to not be afraid to act worthy of themselves. It's, it's truly an incredible thing. It wasn't like these British were 3,000 miles away. They were literally feet in front of him, armed. Yeah. And, and, and some of them that apparently were prepared to kill him. You have to wonder, where, how does someone like that get made? You don't wake up one morning and say, hey, I think I'm going to start being heroic today. It's Monday. Right. What, what, right. What, can you give us some, some sense of, of his background? You know, he, he led an interesting life. Obviously, it was, it, was, <clears throat> it was somewhat tragic. His father died when he was 14. But his, he, he, there's, there's a couple lines that you, you gather from his diary and his letters in which he tells his mother, father did not raise us to be cowards. And so mm-hmm. it was instilled in him by his father before his father passed away when he was 14. But I honestly think, father, in the whole series of all of us in life, you keep on confronting decisions along the way, and, and ultimately you get to a certain point because of the small decisions you've made along the way. And you can right. kind of see these points in Warren's life where he's, I'm not going to shirk for my duty. I'm not going to be afraid. I tru- it, it, and you know what it comes from? He truly – he knew what he believed. And I think that you know, people are like, this is an you know, incredible story of courage. 
but he knew what he believed. And I think many times that courage comes from knowing deep down inside exactly what you believe and being unafraid. I've planted myself on principle and I am unafraid. And, and you know, and that that happens uh, one decision at a time. You move in That's one right. direction or you move in another direction. Friends, I'm talking with Ned Ryan of AmericanMajority.org. We're talking the day after the anniversary of Bunker Hill about his, his new book regarding that battle. It's called The Adversaries, A Story of Boston and Bunker Hill. And I want to give a great big shout out to all our friends who listen to us on WQOM 1060 uh, Boston. Uh, Ned, so he... You, he it's it's a tragic story in a sense he he lived and died as a hero obviously he right. he died too soon uh, what do you think his contribution might have been if he were given more time no i i honestly think he would have played a significant role in the constitutional convention uh, i i think you know again you talk with you know, historians up in Boston, and, and you kind of talk through the life of Warren, and they also have the same opinion. He probably would have been at the Constitutional Convention. Elbridge Jerry, his good friend, was there. Mm-hmm. He probably, presidency was within his grasp. And who knows what he could have become during the Revolutionary War. Again, he's a major general in the newly formed army. I, I, I you know, I think it would have been one of those things where we would have, we would remember him today. He'd be in the same category as Washington and Hancock and Adams. And who would remember Joseph Warren? But but again, he died too soon. He died literally right. days after he turned 34. And he's one of those guys that I think we just I, – I write in the author's note of the book that as I was touring Christ Church in Philadelphia back in 2000, the guy looked, turned around at the end of the tour and looked at us. And these, he said these words that I've remembered very well for the last two decades. He mm-hmm. said, history done well is like the wind at our backs. Yes. And – the life of Warren, we need to understand it. Again, how did he come to be who he was? At the same time, it's, it's not only a cool story and a great story of courage, but it should mm-hmm. inspire us to action today and realize he, this, this is somebody that, that experienced great challenges, showed great courage in, in the face of great threats, and he still rose to the challenge. Now, what does that mean for us today? It should inspire us to action. Right. You know, you you quote Longfellow, A Psalm of Life. You know, Longfellow writes, Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. And I think part of our obligation as Americans is to be grateful heirs of our history. Yes, there are fallen, finite human beings. Yes, there are episodes and chapters that are certainly not proud moments undoubtedly. And yet there, there is something very noble about America's founding. Um, for people who push back against that and say, no, he was a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. He's part of the problem. He needs to be swept into the dustbin of history. How would you respond? Well, my, my response is, let, let's go back and examine who these men were and what they actually gave us. Let's have an honest conversation about what they were envisioning these men who founded the American Republic had a, a singular vision, that we would found a republic based on the entire premise of liberty first, last, and forever. Mm-hmm. And we, always have, we, we haven't always been true to that. But right. at the same time, it was one of these things where all of a sudden it was I, – I, I tend to think, even though it's been a long, torturous march over the centuries and the millennia, that Western civilization has kind of been this march towards freedom, and it's been mm-hmm. a very twisted, very convoluted yeah. route. But all of a sudden you have this, this idea that, that a republic would be founded and, and from day one would be founded upon the idea of freedom and liberty. And again, we haven't been perfect. Again, this is the thing that frustrates me, Father, about progressives, that somehow in an imperfect world we can reach perfection that, that's dangerously naive. And these founders understood that, and they were doing something that we would call aspirational. And again, we've, mm-hmm. we, we failed along the way. But that's why we should understand, you know what, just because they were white Anglo-Saxon males doesn't mean that their idea should be in any way diminished because of what they sought to actually achieve in this world, something that was a completely radical idea, but something that ended up being truly the pinnacle of Western civilization. And, you know, I I tell people all the time, I want to have American history warts and all. But also to understand that the American Constitutional Republic and what it actually produced has led to the greatest amount of freedom and prosperity for this country and for many others, really, than than any other nation in the history of this world.
Now, I, I want to end this segment with a quote from James Madison. He said, if angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. Okay. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and the next place, oblige it to control itself. And boy, you need virtue for that, and you need faith. Friends, when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Ned Ryan of AmericanMajority.org on the day after the anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill. We're talking about his book, That Very Battle. In the next segment, we're going to talk about linking together America's past, present, and future. You don't want to miss that conversation. After the broadcast today, go to the thestationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. Wherever you can find audio, you can find us. Don't just download it and spread it around. Follow the channel, write a five-star review. We need to attract the attention of the algorithm so that these conversations can get the attention they deserve. You bring this to your family and friends, and together we'll take it around the world. We'll be back in just two minutes. Please do stay with us. This is The Catholic Current from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Catch up on an episode you've missed or share them with your family or friends. The Catholic Current is podcasted wherever you enjoy listening. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. On this day, after the anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill, I'm speaking with Ned Ryan of AmericanMajority.org. We're talking about his new book called The Adversaries, A Story of Boston and Bunker Hill. Uh, Now, before we go much further in talking about linking America's past, present, and future, there's a very famous painting of the death of Dr. Joseph Warren at the Battle of Bunker Hill, painted by John Trumbull. We're going to be linking to that in our show notes. Uh, Talk us through that painting, please. You know, it was actually the, the, the painter, John Trumbull, actually witnessed Bunker Hill through a pair of binoculars. He was actually stationed a little south of, of Boston. But, but witnessed the battle, of course, was very familiar with Dr. Joseph Warren. And, you know, the thing that's amazing, really, there, wasn't, there was a little confusion because nobody could find Dr. Joseph Warren in the hours after the battle. Nobody knew if he was alive or dead. Obviously, they find out the next day that he'd actually been killed in, in covering the retreat. So he wanted – John Trumbull wanted to actually do a painting, um, and he, he called it the death of Dr. Joseph Warren at the Battle of Bunker Hill. And he actually started consulting British officers, one of whom, Major John Small, plays a role in this book, The Adversaries, and, and get their advice on what this was all about. And so he came up, he did the painting, and really you, you read about his inspiration. He said, I want it to show, and again, it's a romanticized version of, of how Warren dies on Bunker Hill, but it, it really is a romanticized version. But he wanted to show what happens when, when people that used to be friends – find themselves on the other side of conflict because a lot of these British officers, again, had fought with Israel Putnam and William Prescott during the French and Indian War and all of a sudden find themselves staring down musket barrels at each other. Mm. And and it's one of those things that I do try to hit, kind of inspired by the painting to show this in the book. There's scenes, you know, on the Battle of Lexington and Concord where two two colonists actually find a young grenadier who's been wounded severely wounded. Uh, and it's actually happened in real life where they comfort him until he passes away. But it was one of those things where it's just this touch of humanity. And so with, with the painting, the, the other interesting tidbit I found out about the, the, the death of Dr. Joseph Warren on Bunker Hill painting was one of the finalists to actually be hung in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. Uh, made it, I think, into the last either six or 12 paintings, almost made the final cut, but didn't make it. Uh, and now it's hanging in the Boston uh, Museum of Fine Arts. But it is it is one of the more famous paintings of the American Revolution. But 
if you study that painting, you'll see a lot of faces that appear in my book, whether it's Israel Putnam or Henry Clinton or William Howe, uh, John Pitcairn, obviously Dr. Joseph Warren, Major John Small. You know, I, I called the book The Adversaries because I wanted to highlight a, a conflict between Joseph Warren and a young Irish officer by the name of Francis Lord Rodden. Lord Rodden is in the painting. Uh, his mm-hmm. back is turned to us, the viewer. But it, it really does capture that moment of how people that used to be friends, that used to be allies that were of the same blood, all of a sudden started killing each other uh, on mm. the slopes of Breed Hill that day. There's there's an element of tragedy there. There's certainly an element of, of drama uh, as well. You know, it, it would make a great story even if it weren't true, uh, and it is true, which which makes it a, a, right. an even greater story to tell. Yeah, um, in a lot of my my writings in philosophy and theology, uh, I talk a great deal about time, about past, present, and future. I talk about history and hope. I just want to give you a quick sense of of my view of things, and then you plug in. Bunker Hill in American history and, and Dr. Warren. Standing in the present, you can't face the future with any hope or aspiration unless you have a clear sense of origin, if you have a sense of a debt of gratitude to the past. And when your heritage is bleached out, when your heroes are bleached out, and honestly, when, when tragedies are, are bleached out, when okay. failures are bleached out, you find yourself rootless floating on the surface, all dressed up, nowhere to go. You're bored and you're subject to manipulation. That's a disaster for a civil society. It's, that's a disaster for a human community. W- what's your take on that? And where does your historical writing fit into that, that view? First of all, it's, it's to inform us for the future. I mean, if we don't know where we came from, we don't know where we're going. I mean, that's one of the reasons I wrote the first book, Restoring Our mm-hmm. Republic. Like, where did we come from? Right? What, this didn't just happen. Our founders didn't just from thin air come up with these ideas. It's, it's really truly in a tradition of Rome and Athens and Jerusalem and London mm-hmm. that they pulled these threads to form the republic. So we have to know where we came from to understand, hey, this is the path that we should be taking forward. But also, you know, in this whole the last couple of years of people tearing down statues and, and saying we've got to remove this and, like you said, whitewash our history. We actually learn from our history to learn our mistakes to say we'll never do this again. And so I think right. it's, it's deeply ignorant but also deeply dangerous for us to try and whitewash our history because I tell people this all the time. Again, I come from, a, from, from an evangelical Christian faith in which I truly believe that, that Scripture is inspired by God and actually applies to us today. Mm-hmm. But I tell people that don't have faith, you should be reading the Bible, and you should even be reading Shakespeare. Why? Because they're great commentaries on human nature, and no matter how much the times change, Guess what what remains constant? Human nature. And for us to ignore human nature along the course of our history is really we we do a disservice to ourselves. So it helps us. Our our history helps us understand, really truly understand who we are, mistakes we've made, triumphs that we've had to inspire us to move forward, but also helps us to correct our mistakes from the past. Right. Right. I, I think it would be a, a tragic mistake. It would be a, a dishonoring of the great lessons to be learned, both the cautionary tales and, and the inspirational tales. You were part of the 1776 project until the, the plug right. was pulled uh, after the, the paradigm shift had taken a place. And the 1776 project wasn't just a good idea in its own right. It was in response to another project. Tell us about that, please. It, re- it really was a response, the, the 1776 uh, commission, but you're right, overall project, because it wasn't just being about a commission. It was, a, it was we were trying to come and create curriculum to go into the public school system to combat two things very specifically, 1619 project, which really was an attempt to revise our history and say, I mean, literally the, the first ever essay in the 1619 project was to say that our founders fought the American revolution because they wanted to preserve the institution of slavery. That's a flat-out lie. Critical race theory is, of course, another insidious thing that's being taught in our schools, and it really is Marxism, but it's Marxism based on race, not class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what we wanted to do with the 1776 Project Commission is go in and say, listen, we're going to teach American history. We're going to have an honest discussion about our history. But the most important thing is we wanted to actually teach young children to love their country and not hate it which is what a lot of what progressive leftists are doing right now with the 1619 Project and CRT is 
They are literally indoctrinating our children to hate this country. And I say we have to love this country warts and all because of what it has meant to the world. I mean, we truly are one of the last bastions of freedom. And that's why this, this battle is very real about who we are as a people, where we came from. Because if the American Republic goes down, I truly believe we, we are the last best hope for this world because of our founding, because of what we are founded upon. And if we go down, really, who else is out there? I mean, this is, this is a question I think we need to ask ourselves. Where do we go from here if the American Republic collapses? Friends, I'm speaking with Ned Ryan of AmericanMajority.org. We're using as a point of departure his book called The Adversaries, A Story of Boston and Bunker Hill. Ned, I, I think that there, there, really is, there really is a place for a kind of American exceptionalism, and it's not to be relativized. Now, I know it's true, you know, it's, it's a virtue. Even St. Thomas Aquinas said it's a virtue to have patriotic feelings, to have warmth and affection for the land of your birth. And that's true no matter right. where you're born. But there was something different about the American founding. There was something different about the American living that other people found attractive. So either they wanted to reorganize their own communities in light of those principles, or they wanted to come here and set up shop on their own. And for all of the complaints about the, the tragic elements in American history, and there are, we're not, we're not pretending they're not there, right. uh, people seem to be in a desperate hurry to, to get here. Why is that? Because this is a land of opportunity. I mean, this is true. And we're, the, the, the amazing part about this country, you can literally, and I, I've know, I know this because I've traveled in many other parts of the world, where you can go immigrate to, I don't know, Germany or France. You'll never truly be considered German or French. You can come here, become naturalized, become a, a citizen. All of a sudden, no matter where you came from, you're an American. And you mm -hmm. get to embrace all of these opportunities, the freedom and the ability to actually achieve and pursue all of your God-given rights to, to basically go as far as you want to. And I think that's one of the things that, again, obviously, the, the, those that came over in the 16 and 1700s, still today, right? We can come to the land of opportunity and based off everything that has been instilled in us by our creator, the determination and the talents, the uniqueness that each one of us has as a created human being, we can pursue all of those things in this country and achieve really, we only limit ourselves in many ways. That's kind of one of the promises of who we are as a people. And that's why people want to come here because right. we do have so much opportunity. And the thing that, that is really on the line right now is, you know, is it still going to be that a generation from now? I would even argue 10 years from now, if we're not careful. Well, tell, tell us more about that. What, what, what's, what's the risk? The risk is that we, well, first of all, this is the great struggle and the great battle. You know, what is, what do we believe about human nature? Why right? does kind of the founders versus the progressives, as I mentioned earlier, but what is the role of government? Where do our rights come from? And if you come from the founders, you understand that our rights are given to us by God, by, by a creator. Transcendent rights, natural rights, inherent rights that no government can either give or take mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. With progressives, they truly believe that government exists and basically gives you rights to do certain things. Well, a government that can give you those rights can also take them away. And yes. I think this is the great struggle of understanding human nature and the proper role of government in our lives. We have a need for government. As you quoted Madison, right? We're no angels. Mm -hmm. We're no angels. And because of that, there is a need for government to provide a certain amount of boundaries of, within which we can hopefully operate as freely as possible. At the same time, realize there are certain restrictions. But this is, this is the great struggle. And if we're not careful, I mean, the, the, the administrative state, which is another form of statism, in which man starts to serve the state instead of the state serving man. I mean, if you right. were really to come up and, and encapsulate it to that, that, that's really what's at stake. Are we going to serve the state, or is the state going to serve us? Right, and then we have to decide: are you know, are we really merely subjects of the state, or are we are we free citizens? And and if we were, uh, and, and we're talking more in history and politics. For for my theologically minded friends, I still do believe in the social reign of Christ the King. Make no mistake. So I, I want to add that. Uh, Ned, we've got about a minute left. What, what advice would you give to parents and teachers in this time of confusion? We're called we're called to action. I think we're called to action in all aspects of our life, whether it's going into the public arena and, and, and preach, talking about our faith, talking about our ideas. But also, I, I say this, Father, all the time. 
we authenticate our beliefs by what we actually do. And we show through our actions that we truly believe something. And I think it's, it's incumbent upon all of us. I'm going into action here in Loudoun County, Virginia, because of the school board situation and then with critical race theory and trying to indoctrinate our children. There will be action and there will be consequences for those pushing these, these crazy ideas. I think that's what parents and teachers need to understand. Decide what you believe. And if you truly say if you truly believe what you say you believe, it will drive you into action. It should be meaningful, purposeful action. So be inspired. And the other thing is, don't be afraid. If you truly believe and are convinced that what you're doing is right, you should not be afraid. Right. And, and you know, God can only bless what we do and not what we fail to do. Ned Ryan, thank you That's for right. being a very fine guest. I, I enjoyed reading your book, and I, I hope we can have another conversation before long. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm Jesuit Father Robert McKaig. You want to stay with us in the next segment. It's Friday, which means it's you and me with weekend readiness, looking at the headlines of the week in light of the upcoming Sunday scriptures so that you can be all prayed up for Mass on Sunday. After the broadcast today, go to thestationofthecross.com, get a resources list, download our audio podcast, follow us on Gab, that's G-A-B dot com. Our channel is The Catholic Current. We'll be back in just two minutes. Please do stay with us. Each weekday from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern, the Station of the Cross brings you Mother Miriam Live. It is Christ's church. He will build it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. But it's time for us, the remnant, to step up and do everything we can. Tune in from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern for Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross and our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. You can also watch the video stream every day on Facebook or on YouTube. After today's broadcast, go to the Catholic Current Show page on thestationofthecross.com for info on today's guests, the show resource links, and to sign up for our weekly email of upcoming shows. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTigg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. It's Friday. I mean, it's the last segment. It's you and me sharing weekend readiness. I review the headlines of the past week in light of the upcoming Sunday scripture, so you'll be all prayed up for Mass on Sunday. If you're following the Novus Order calendar of the Paul Online, right? We're in the 12th Sunday of Ordinary Time, Lectionary 95. Uh, friends, I'm hesitant to speak today. I, I have to be honest because I don't want to sound like a political partisan. There are some things taking place in the news that just represents the overlap of theology and politics, and, and there it is. Remember, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops is meeting this week, and they're talking about Eucharistic coherence, which as far as I can understand it, is they're very nearly on the verge of considering the possibility of developing a methodology to discuss how to have a conversation about whether or not they need to discern to implement canon law and act in light of Scripture, in particular, giving Holy Communion to public, manifest, obstinate sinners in this particular case, self-identified Catholic politicians who rather enthusiastically support abortion, are they allowed to receive Holy Communion or not? I'm not a canon lawyer. You read Canon 915 yourself, draw your own conclusion. My conclusion is this. You can't receive Holy Communion. St. Paul is very clear. When you receive the body and blood of the Lord unworthily, you bring condemnation upon yourself. Case in point. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi was at a press conference. She describes herself as a devout Catholic. And yesterday she was asked if an unborn baby at 15 weeks, a human being. Here's what she said. I'm quoting. Let me just say that I am a big supporter of Roe versus Wade. I am a mother of five children in six years. I think I have some standing on the issue as respecting a woman's right to choose. Now, notice she didn't do the, the two-step of, oh, it's human, but no one knows whether it's a person. It wasn't even that. It was, nope, Roe versus Wade, right to choose, the end. 
I'm a big supporter of Roe versus Wade, not a reluctant supporter, not tragically, I tolerate abortion because of all these proportionate reasons with some vague reference to natural law. She is a big supporter of snuffing out life in the womb. She said it herself. She hasn't tried to hide it. And whenever the Born Alive Protection Act comes to the floor, in other words, that bill that would provide health care for children who had the audacity to survive their own abortion, she won't let that even come to a vote. She's blocked it dozens of times. So that's number one. Number two, the Internal Revenue Service has issued a ruling about a religious group in Texas and says, no, you can't, you can't be a tax-exempt organization because you encourage Bible reading and prayer. And here I quote from the document, and Bible reading and prayer boost the Republican Party. I'm not kidding. Look this up yourself. I've brought to my attention in the Epoch Times. So there we are. And our shepherds are wondering if even they should talk about, talking about, talking about enforcing Eucharistic law. This is not a new thing. This is not 1974. We've been dealing with abortion for all, and Catholic politicians for almost 50 years. All the resources to make a good decision are there. There's the letter from Cardinal Ratzinger in 2004. There's Evangelium Vitae from John Paul in 1995. There's the Code of Canon Law in 1983. There's the Code of Canon Law in 1917. There is St. Paul. If it is that hard, I guess I'm a slow learner. Someone please call and explain it to me. Meanwhile, we have the scriptures here. There's a, there's a joke that whoever put the lectionary together for the Novus Ordo never had to preach from it. And sometimes I'm inclined to agree because in the gospel we have Mark chapter 4, our Lord appearing, you know, walking on the water during the storm. And I guess someone said, hey, um, water, storm, go find something in the Old Testament. And so we have from Job where God is asking Job, hey, you really want to question me about how I manage the universe? All right, tell me about uh, who shut within the doors the, the sea when it burst forth from the womb, who made the clouds its garments. Anyway, a lot of poetry there. In light of what's going on in our world and a lot of what's going on in the human elements of the church in America right now, think on this. The ocean, the storm, in the biblical worldview that's the powers of chaos. That's the disorganized. It's the unruly. It is the unruled. It is the unformed. It can become a source of life, but right now it's only undifferentiated death and destruction. And God brings order. Go all the way back to Genesis. The Spirit brooded over the waters. And here is the Christ of God, Jesus, who is Son of God and Son of Mary, the eternal Word of the Father. And the disciples don't understand who is with them in the boat. They don't understand who is with them while they're riding the stormy sea. They do see that their beloved Lord is just asleep in the boat, as if nothing is going on, as if he doesn't have a care in the world. And they cry out to him and say, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? If we're really honest, if we're really, really honest with ourselves and with God, and we need to do both, believe me, then, oh my goodness, well, yes, of course, we ask that question too. Do you not care that we are perishing? And our Lord rebukes the storm. He says, quiet, be still. Mark records, the wind ceased and there was great calm. And then he asked them, why are you terrified? Do you not yet have faith? What's the moral of the story for the disciples and for us? Remember, the stormy ocean represents chaos. It represents disorder. It represents that those dimensions of reality that have not surrendered to the authority of God, to the right order of the Logos of the Father. That's very much the world we're living in. And if we look at the storm... If we look at the chaos rather than the word, if we look at the rebellion rather than the king, then of course we're going to panic. Of course we're going to be discouraged. Of course we're going to be tempted towards despair because we're facing the wrong direction. I have it on good authority that in the discussion that the bishops were having about Eucharistic coherence, they were given this bit of advice. They were told, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Honestly, I don't find that helpful. It's a platitude. Whether you're going fast or slow, 
far or near. If you're going in the wrong direction, you have to turn around. That's true for us as human members of the church in the United States. It's true for the human members of the church in the Western world. And it's true for those of us who, like me, are sinners. Remember, the Greek word for sin is hamartia. It's an archery word. It means to miss the mark. We miss the mark when our aim is off, when we're facing in the wrong direction. Conversion, repentance, metanoia means a turning around. It's time to recalibrate, to reorient ourselves. Our compasses need to point north or we're never going to get to where we should be. And for those who have the good sense to keep their eye on Christ the King rather than the rebellion, those who have the good sense to keep their eyes on the Creator rather than the storm, who keep their eyes on the Logos of the Father rather than the disorder, then they can have peace because they know they are provided for. And we know that no rebel can defeat Christ. If you're uncertain about that, ask St. Michael. Ask St. Michael what happens to those who rebel against Christ. Friends, it's a frightful time. There is no doubt. I get discouraged. I get worn out. I wonder if I'm just talking into a microphone and no one hears me but my engineer. But I show up every day because I know that a treasure has been entrusted to me, and the treasure is Christ. And that is the treasure of the church. It's not social services, it's not platitudes, it's not good ideas, it's not programs. It is the person of Christ. Let us proclaim him till our dying breath. May God's holy name be praised now and forever. I'm Jesuit Father Robert McTague, your host every day here at The Catholic Current. Join me on Monday when we welcome back Bishop Michael Olson of Fort Worth, Texas, to talk about what happened at the bishops' meeting this week. It's an important conversation. You don't want to miss it. Through the intercession of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, may God our Lord protect you from all harm and every evil to you reach the happiness of heaven. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Go in peace and please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Station of the Cross.com, a listener funded nonprofit organization. If this podcast has helped you in your spiritual journey, please prayerfully consider donating at the Station of the Cross.com by calling 1 877 888 6279 or through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app.